Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? How's everybody doing? It is I, it is me, it is she, it's just E from It's Just E TV. And you are now watching my Car Chronicle, my Car Chronicle series about uh, the trial. Um, it's a criminal trial that I'm going through. This is my series. You guys, again, won't be seeing it until after we deliberate, after we give the verdict. And so I am chronicling this every day of the trial after we get out. So it's in fresh in my brain. And when I start dropping these after the trial is over, you guys get to see it. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. Again, this is a criminal trial that I am on the juror. I'm one of the jurors. And um, it is going to be for 22 days. It is a um, trial that has two defendants. Um, and it is a criminal case. The criminal case is um, essentially a conspiracy to commit murder. Um, it actually has um, some possession of firearms, domestic violence. Um, it's basically, uh, if I had to sum it up, it is wrapped around relationship, money, and loyalty. If I had to sum it up, and I am on day three day three of the trial let me take these off i'm out of here take my glasses off take my glasses off y'all bear with me bear with me hopefully you guys are having a wonderful day it is wednesday march 20th 2014 again chrono uh chronologing this let me see i'm trying to put on my glasses and drive at the same time bear with me here so yes all right, I'm back. So we are on day three of the trial, and it is Wednesday. So today, it's kind of dark in here. I'm trying to make sure I get everything looking cool so y'all can see. So hopefully that helps a little bit. This is day three of the trial. Um, we have, uh, what was yesterday? Yesterday, we sat, I sat through the continuation of the um, young boy who was 10 years old and two officers. And I gave that information on that last, um, my last video that I did yesterday. Um, is there anything I missed out on that one? I don't think so um, with regards to that. Today, we actually continued with uh, the officer from yesterday, the last officer um, who was with the special incident unit, he came back and they had some follow-up questions uh, from the defense attorneys for the defendants. And so they were basically trying to uh, get information out of him with regards to um, evidence that he had uh, provided evidence that he said that he collected or yeah that he collected um from the from the uh the actual um from the actual site um how that evidence was uh captured and there was a picture that the one of the defense attorneys brought into evidence and the photo was of the it was a shell casing from one of the bullets that was uh we assume that was used, that was uh, fired into the truck where the ex-girlfriend, her son, the 10-year-old, and her new boyfriend was in. Um, it's also a shell casing that um, if it is actually from that incident, that would be four shell casings because they had already showed um, pictures of where three shell casings were on the ground, not in the vehicle. So this one was crazy because 
they didn't catch it, right? They didn't catch this other casing. So the body cam had footage of it. So the, the uh, officer that attended to the ex-girlfriend who was slumped over in the car, his body cam caught it, but he didn't catch it. So that casing and a part of her, part of a tooth was still in the vehicle. Now get this, that vehicle, this happened in 2022. So I think I said that earlier, but if I didn't, this whole incident started in 2022. It happened in 2022, October of 2022. Um, and so they are just now prosecuting uh, this case. Two years later, we're in 2024. That shell casing was still in the truck along with that chip tooth. It was found by the owner of the truck, which is the ex-girlfriend. She just picked up that truck two weeks ago. That truck has been at the police department, um, I guess in their, uh, where they house the cars that they keep for evidence. So that car has been there for two, that truck has been there for two years. In that time frame, nobody, nobody, and they supposedly went through this truck, supposedly, but nobody saw the extra casing, bullet casing, and a piece of tooth in the truck. She found it and brought it to him. That's what I said. She found it, the owner of the truck, the ex-girlfriend who was uh, shot, found it in the truck when she came to pick up her truck they finally released it to her two weeks ago and she brought it back since she brought them the evidence of the additional uh casey so when they asked them asked the, the uh, officer did you see this um did you happen to see this in the in the in said vehicle in the truck he did not he said because his primary focus he gave what he what they primarily focus on in, in situations like this normally when he comes when they come on the scene of something like this they their first thing is to make sure that uh, the suspect is the suspect still around are you know could they potentially still be around are they could they potentially be in danger because you know suspect may be still there and if they're armed they could you know take shots at the officer so their first order of business is to make sure that they're safe and then see if the suspect is anywhere in the vicinity of the you know where the incident took place second is then to um, assess the situation and any victims um, and tend to them and then third is to start you know collecting evidence the evidence as I like to call it so he said he did not he did not remember seeing it but probably because he was at the time trying to uh pull the ex-girlfriend who was shot and she was shot twice once through her uh jaw her face and then also in her back area so she was slumped over so he was trying to uh, ascertain could he get her out of the truck in order to get you know to, to help her but at the time the way it was they thought it was best that she stay in the truck so I, he did not see it at the time so that was his first time seeing it when she um, she identified it and brought it to him and then they looked at body cam footage his the, the uh, officer's body cam footage and spotted it on his body cam footage but he didn't see it his body cam caught it from his chest so <laughs> that was strange then um did they cross examine and that was the cross examination from uh one of the defendants one of the, the defendant's attorney because there's two defendants on trial some of the information we have to assess with them together and then some is only you know for one or the other so that was that uh, information. Second officer was a sergeant. 
Um, he had been with the who was he with? He had been with the forest department for he said 14 years. He had been with the forest 14 years. He's only been with this uh, our county with this department. So he wasn't he wasn't um, he didn't come from anywhere else. He has been a sergeant for the last two years. So when this incident occurred, he was actually a, a sergeant at the time. He came on the scene. He wasn't there the day of the uh, incident. Um, he came on, he came into the, uh, he came into the, the situation a few days after where they had um, obtained warrants for uh, the suspects, the defendants. And so his job was to survey, survey the um, suspects and um, arrest them, essentially arrest them, um, give them uh, the, the search warrants. So he was going to, um, he surveyed them. So he surveyed the first defendant at his home. Um, saw him get picked up by someone else, not in the same vehicle, not in the Burgundy Apollo, but his friend picked him up in a white truck. They then left, went to another friend's house, which I thought was interesting because the, uh, uh, the other friend happened to be, and I caught what the defendant was, the defense attorney was doing. The other friend that he went to go see, uh, his friend that picked him up was Hispanic. The other friend that he went to go see was black. And he showed that and I thought that was, you know, I, I get what he's doing because the sus the other suspect or the other defendant is black. So it's a this is a black and brown defendant. Defendant. So the ex-boyfriend is Hispanic, the uh, friend of the Hispanic boyfriend is black. But they were showing that he has another black friend. You know what I'm saying? So it's not he does he doesn't just have one black friend. The friend that they actually went to his house where they actually um Surveyed, surveyed him. They did surveillance on him before they picked him up. It was at the other black friend's house. So they showed his picture, um, and they showed his picture right over uh, the defendant. The black defendant happens to be right uh, under, sitting right under the projector. So you can see him and the other guy. Uh, the only thing that was similar is that they probably the same uh, color of skin, but they don't look alike but still same color of skin. But I am, I don't, I understand me, I look at facial features and facial structures. Some people don't. Some people would just say, oh, it's two black men. You know, they the same color. You know, both have short hair. They don't have difference of hair color or anything like that. But they do look, to me, distinctively different. Um, but some people don't look at people like that. They just see black men, short hair, same color, same person right so I'm just putting that out there um, but saw that so then when they picked him up they also uh, asked um, the defendants uh, the defense attorney asked at that point when they picked up um, the suspect one of the defendants the ex-boyfriend who they're saying shot the ex-girlfriend shot the girl when they picked him up did they um, did they search the uh, friend who brought him there in the white truck? Did they search his truck? They said yes. Um, they did look through his truck. They didn't find anything. Then they said when they picked him up at the other friend's home, the other black guy that he knew, that they searched, that they have a search warrant or search his house. They said no. So they did not search his home. Um, the second time the sergeant same day they surveilled um the second defendant's house because they had warrants for both of their arrests um they said they served uh had surveillance on the other suspect the other defendant the black guy that they said was also in the car with him when he shot when he supposedly shot uh the ex-girlfriend um so they picked him up after they surveyed him getting in his car, driving um, to another area, but then they lost him. 
um, they he was being uh, tailed by I think two other police officers, but all of them lost him. I don't know that how that happens, but all three of them lost him in traffic. So they decided to surveil the uh, the shop where the uh, other defendant he, he owns a shop in the in the town. And so they surveilled that place. The other suspect, they said, actually came to the shop, uh, went in the shop, came out of the shop, and then he was walking back to his vehicle. And uh, that's when they picked him up. So they made it seem like he parked somewhere else kind of sneakily and then walked over. But then the defense attorney kind of said, okay, based on where this this um, building, this this shop is located. It's on a busy street. There is no parking on that busy street. It's one of the main roads in the town, which I'm familiar with. I'm familiar with both towns where the shop is and also where the actual incident happened. So I'm familiar with both, uh, very familiar with both. And so he's correct. You cannot park on that street. It's a main street. So there is a entrance from the main street to that uh, that shop, however, it's gated. And at the time, that gate was closed because the office was closed. I mean, he didn't say the office closed. He said the gate was closed. And so the, uh, and also it's gated for customers. So the other access point to the office was, excuse me, to the shop was for the customer. And that was on a different side. So he could not park on the street because that's a main street. He could not park in the uh, shop's parking because the gate was closed. So he had no choice but to go on the side street, find a park in a residential neighborhood because off uh, the cross street and the other streets are residential. So he had to find a park on the, off, on the side street and walk over. But the way the prosecutor made it seem is like, oh, he, they found his car after they arrested him, they found his car on a side street. Uh, they named the street. Like he, you know, he was doing it sneakily. He just wanted to park somewhere else and then walk over there. But it wasn't that, it was that the parking lot was closed and it's gated to a shop. And also that the uh, entrance to the shop was on a, the opposite side. So he had to end up parking in a residential area, finding a park. Um, where other people, residence houses were, he had to find somewhere to park and then walk over to the place. So I thought that was good because um, I was like, why is he parking? It does seem kind of sketchy. Um, and the officer corroborated that. They showed evidence for that. They showed the street, the street view, um, where he was parked, how the, the building, what the building looks like, how it's positioned on the street. Um, the side street, the cross street, and where the uh, defendant was parked. So, all made sense. Um, then the last person that they brought up, did the defendant, wait, did the defendant, because I have to remember all this. I hate the fact that I can't take my notes, so I'm getting in here and trying to get it raw. I think that was it with them. Then they let him, the prosecution and both defendants cross-examine him they let him down, but they let him know that they, he may be recalled. He may be called back for further um, for further questioning, but they let him go for today. The third and final person that came up today was the actual uh, ex-girlfriend. She came up. She was the last witness today. Um, she came up, and um, we pretty much only went. We only got to hear her speak to the prosecutor. This one, you guys, was a little bit, how can I say this? I can tell she was nervous because um, she was shaking her leg a lot when she was talking, twiddling with her hand. Um, There's a couple of times she teared up. So I understand trying to relive this, you know, this situation again. She was shot in the jaw, shot in the, you know, went out, the bullet went out her mouth. So it went like this in like this out her mouth and then also um, in her back the other bullet went through her back 
So I can definitely understand, you know, being having to relive something that happened two years ago, also having to rem remember something that happened two years ago. Um, can be trying, can be very difficult. Um, and also, what else did I glean from her? But she she couldn't really. She was talking very low, very light. Um, a lot of times, like her son, she but her son would say, "I don't, I don't understand." Right? He would say, "I don't understand." She would just like when the prosecution was asking her a simple question, like, "How did you guys meet?" Um, uh, or you know, asking her to kind of like give the first instance when you know their relationship got violent. The first time he, you know, uh, uh, touched her in a violent way, um, she would just like, it wasn't like shut down. It was just like, she was just like, look, and it would be these awkward, long pauses. And then the prosecutor would be like, do you understand the question? And she'd be like, no. And I'm like, how do you not understand the question? And then she's like, okay. And then she would try to ask her in a different way. And she still would pause and just be staring at her. And the prosecutor said, if at any point, you know, if you don't understand or you need me to ask in any way differently, she's like, I have no problem in doing so. And this is just how she was talking, very light, very soft, and just letting her know that, you know, I'm here for you. If you, if you need me to ask a different way, I have no problem doing that. You know, just let me know. And she would say, okay. But at every point, she, most of the time, she wasn't getting it and she wouldn't, she would just stare. And then if she did say something, she said, yes. Like very light, yes. And then, you know, she wasn't talking into the mic. And I was like, you know, I'm trying to hear her. And I'm, you know, basically maybe about, I want to say five feet away from her, give or take. So I should be able to hear her, but it was very hard for me to hear because she's not speaking very loud and she's not di directly speaking in the mic. They had to definitely direct her to speak into the mic several times. Um, she's very vague with her answers. And again, like I said, I think she was having problems remembering but they also said something about her prior to this that she did have and I'm trying not to you know hold that uh, against her but I can see where it's coming into play that she has some you know uh, prior drug use um, so I didn't know if that that could potentially be why she wasn't understanding when he was asking her questions, when she was, when the defense, the district, district attorney was asking her the probing questions, and she was basically, the district attorney was trying to um, basically establish a baseline of how they met, um, their relationship, you know, how their relationship was, how did it come to be, how did you end up, you know, with the other guy. You know, she was basically trying to ask questions to establish that so we can understand, you know, how they met, where they met, you know, how long they were together. Um, some other questions I didn't like that she tried to imply. She was like, how old are you? How tall are you? You know, are you, you know, do you have any children? Um, and then she's like, how old, how old is he? How tall is he? You know, trying to make it seem like, you know, she's 5'2", he's 5'7". She, I think she says she's 29, they believe he's like 32, 33. So a little bit older than her, um, a little bit bigger than her. So, you know, trying to establish that, you know, she's a smaller girl, he's more dominant, you know, prone to, you know, and then they had like a toxic relationship. So prone to violence, things of that nature. So I, I get what she was trying to do. Um, but I was trying to get, you know, hear more. Uh, again, today, uh, she's going to come back. They didn't really get a chance to finish. Um, again, it took so long. It, her testimony took like probably about the remaining 45 minutes 
to, you know, and the prosecutor still wasn't finished asking the questions. But it, because she kept pausing and not answering or saying that she doesn't, you know, she don't understand the question, it, it made it take a whole lot longer. Um, and again, I'm taking into account she's nervous. I'm also taking into account this was very traumatic for her. Um, being shot, you know, um, and having to live through it and then having to remember everything about their relationship and what actually happened, which took place two years ago. So I, I'm definitely taking that into consideration, but it was very hard to follow because she was unable to like give very um, specific answers uh, and to the questions that she was able to answer. Um, it was very, very short, um, not very descriptive, um, and she, it was hard to hear her. So that was my takeaway from her. She'll be back on the stand the next time we meet. Um, we're meeting next week, so this is the last day for uh, this week. We'll be back next week into the in the courtroom. So that will be day four next week. Um, again, right now, hearing evidence again from the prosecution remember the onus is on the prosecution to prove uh within reasonable doubt that uh both defendants are guilty of said crimes which is conspiracy to commit murder uh willful uh what's it called willful premeditated deliberate murder and as of today again I still have not heard anything or seen oh and the other thing with this the gun that was used has not been found there is no gun they have never found the gun so there is no gun to they just have the tail cases but no gun so again still haven't seen uh, oh and they also what did they say uh, there was another piece like, there's another piece um, there was a point where the defendant asked the first officer that came back about um, the uh, defendant's car, which I told you was a Burgundy Impala, right? So that Burgundy Impala was also pulled over, um, I want to say a few days before the incident. The police pulled them over for whatever reason. They didn't give a reason why it was pulled over. But they did pull that, that Burgundy Impala, that said Burgundy Impala that's in question for this, this whole crime, uh, was pulled over days before the incident, days before the shooting. And the driver was not the uh, defendant, nor was the defendant ever in the car. So that lets me know that he's not the only person that drives that car. So again, now we're looking at, he lets other people drive that car. It was the car, the license plates matched the car, but when it got pulled over the first time prior to the shooting, he was not the driver of the car, nor was the other guy the driver of the car. So it was someone totally different driving the car. So that also plays a part also. So again, if I had to deliberate, me personally, as a juror, if I had to deliberate, I'm still not guilty. Despite, I do feel for the son and I do feel for the, 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 the young lady uh, being shot the way she was shot. I really do. I am very, you know, empathetic to that. However, I still do not have enough evidence, in my opinion, based on the photos, based on the cam footage, based on the city cam footage, based on the body cam based on the pictures of the location, based on uh, the evidence that they presented thus far, I still don't have enough to where I would say that these two individuals are said shooters and that they are the people who uh, committed this crime or the charges that are there. Based on what she has to prove, the elements that she needs to prove, the elements that she's trying to prove of these charges that she's put, that the DA has put on these defendants, I still would plead 
not guilty. It's not enough uh, for me to to find these uh, individuals guilty. Uh, I have reasonable doubt based on everything that's been presented thus far. So y'all let me know, what do you think based on what I've explained to you? Is there anything that you feel that I did not explain thoroughly? Put it in the comments. But based on what I've told you about this uh, case, this case is good based on money, relationship, and loyalty from what I can see thus far. It's conspiracy to commit murder. It has uh, a shooting, um, two defendants, two, uh, two uh, incidents, two victims that were shot at or shot. Um, there is uh, firearms involved. There is, um, well, we're still getting to the other part. So I can't tell you the other parts yet until it gets to it. Because I don't have any additional information. But y'all let me know what you think about what I've stated thus far. If you be, if you were a juror in this case thus far, would you say guilty or not guilty based on the information I provided to you? You let me know in the comments. Again, thank you guys for rocking with me. This has been my car chronicle. This has been for my series for the trial, the criminal trial that I'm on as a juror. Y'all let me know. Thumbs it up. Thumbs it down. It's whatever. I do not take offense. Like, comment, share, and subscribe to your girl if you haven't already subscribed. We like to have fun over here. This is what we like to do. This is just another layer to me, and I wanted to invite you into my world as a juror. So, share, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Until then,